Yeah, I am. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's do a little review. We're going to do, we're kind of just going to, we've done most of what we're going to do for quadratic functions, but we got to add a few little bits and pieces. And so what we're going to do today involves reviewing a couple things that we've already done and then adding one little bit to that, okay, one, little, one little new wrinkle. So we got to go back a little bit. We're going to go back to unit four where we graphed quadratic functions, right? Okay, so let's look at a couple examples that we know how to do already, but maybe we ought to review. It's been a little while. Before you can graph a quadratic function, the first thing you got to do is you got to recognize what form it's in. Let's get everybody closing up all the Chromebooks. I want, I don't mind you guys having them out. You can come in and get them and get some work done while I'm taking a roll and things, but you got to close them up when I'm ready for you to. So click them all the way close. Okay. Uh, what form is this in? It's in vertex form. Good. So you got to recognize that. This is in vertex form. <coughs> which is f of x equals what? a times x minus h plus k squared yeah. <laughs> plus k. So our vertex is located at hk. What do we call a again? It's, what do we call that? Uh, it's the what factor? I heard it. Dilation. Dilation factor. There you go. Okay, so that's telling us A tells us how much the function's been stretched or compressed vertically, right? And then H and K just tells us where we're going to slide the vertex. So if we can just identify those things, this is really easy to, to graph this function. So what are the values of h and k? One. So h is 1, right, because that's the number being subtracted from x. And what's k? 7. 7. Okay, so we know that the vertex is going to end up being there. Uh, what's the dilation factor, a? Negative 1 half. Okay, so what we've got to do then, remember, when we're in the, probably the hardest part of this is dilating the function. Right, so we always have to start off with our parent graph, y equals x squared, and then we're gonna we're gonna tweak that. We're either gonna compress it or stretch it to get our dilated graph. So that's the first step. So we want to write down. I'm just gonna put a quick sketch of our parent graph. What is the parent graph for any quadratic function? What's the most basic quadratic function that we can draw that we always start with? Well, which one? Y equals what? Yeah, I heard it. Y equals x squared, right? That's our parent graph for all parabolas. So let's see, if I go over, the vertex is at the origin, right? When x is 0, y is 0. What about when x is 1? What's the y value? 1. 1. What if x is negative 1? 2. No, hang on. Oh, negative 1. 1, right? Because negative 1 squared is 1. And we're going to have that kind of symmetry around the vertex. What about when x is 2? 4. 4, okay. When x is 3? 9. 9, okay. And we got the same stuff on this side. So let's just write in a couple of ordered pairs. So that's 3, 9. This guy right here is going to be 2, 4. And this one right here is 1, 1, right? And if we connect those... We just get a regular parabola. Now, what if a is negative 1 half? What do we multiply the dilation factor by? Not two. I mean, what's, what's the, what, are we, what does this do? In order to stretch or compress, what am I multiplying by 1 half? Negative 1 half. Uh, the y values, right. I'm going to multiply the vertical values by the dilation factor to stretch or compress them. right? So I'm going to multiply one of these vertical coordinates by negative one half, which is the most convenient? Four. four. Yeah, two four is, right? Four times one half is going to give us back a whole number, right? So that's good. So if we multiply four times negative, what's this bad? Negative one half, what do I get for my answer? Negative ten. Yeah. Four over one times negative one over four, I get Negative 2, don't I? Because 
negative 4 over 2 is negative 2. Right? So what's that tell us? That tells us that we're going to slide this point down to there. right? And then the vertex is going to stay put, but all the other points are going to get squished through the x-axis with this one. Right? So we end up with a graph that's going to look like going to look like this. That's a pretty bad parabola, but you get the idea, right? Sure. So there's our dilated parabola. Now, Riley, where am I going to move this thing? The vertex starts off at 0, 0, but where am I going to move it? What do we say up here? 1, 7. One, seven. Yeah, those are the values of h and k, right? So we got to take this thing, we got to drag it to the point. 1, 7, so our new vertex should be over 1 and up 7, so we got to drag it up to there, right? So let's see if I can do that. Maybe. There, I don't know. Oh, I did the last period. I got it. There we go. Okay, so if I just drag this thing up to there, that's where it goes. That's our answer. Right? I don't know why it's doing it. It's this. It's something up here. It? I see so much better. I keep walking that way. It looks better this way. Yeah. You like it better this way? Yeah. All right, I'll leave it this way. That's fine. So, so that, that's our answer then. That's the graph, right? We've got the dilation of negative one-fifth, and we slide it so the vertex goes there at one-seven. No big deal. We know how to do that stuff. How about something like this? What form is this in? Standard. It's in standard form. Right. So this is in the form. <coughs> Let's put all phones away, please. Just AX squared plus BX plus C, right? So what are A, B, and C for us? A is negative 5, B is 40. <coughs> C is negative 85, right? Good. Okay, but how did, how did we do a graph of a function like this? Now, we need to know, we need to be able to dilate it. We know what the dilation factor, what's that? Negative 5. Negative 5. Okay, so we're, gonna, we're going to stretch this thing vertically by 5 and reflect it, right? Okay, what about H and K, though? That's the part, if we could just find the values of h and k, we could do it just like the last one. Now, we had a little trick for that. So when we start off in standard form, do you remember? What was it again? Negative b over 2a. Good. So we have a formula h equals negative b over 2a, right? And if, once we know h, k is easy to find. How do we find any y value for any function if I know the x value? Plug it in. Plug it in, right? So k is going to be f of h, whatever h ends up being. All right, so let's plug these in and see. So B is 40, so negative B is negative 40 over 2 times negative 5. That's going to give me negative 40 over negative 10. What's that? 4. Negative 40 over negative 10. Yeah, we get the positive answer, don't we? Negative over negative is positive. So we get 4 is our value for H. That's the X coordinate of the vertex. If we plug in 4 into our function, what are we going to get? Well, let's see. Negative 5 times 4 squared plus 40 times 4 minus 85. So 4 squared is what? 16, 16 times negative 5? Negative 80. Negative 80 plus 160 minus 85. What's that give us? Yeah, negative 5, isn't it? Negative 165 plus positive 160 is negative 5. So, so this ends up being really no harder than the last one. We know, we know what our dilation factor is. So if we are going to stretch our basic parabola, and because our, our, um, our dilation factor is 
not a fraction, why don't we just use as our convenient point, let's just use the point one one, right? If I multiply that y value of one times negative five, where does this point get stretched to then? Yeah, it's gonna go all the way down to there, right? And so we're gonna get this tall, skinny parabola like so, right? <coughs> And where is it going to get dragged? So h was negative, or was 4. 4 negative 5. Yeah, 4 negative 5. Yeah. hk equaled 4 negative 5. So we're just going to put this thing, so the vertex is over 4 down 5, right there. So it's just going to get dragged. It's just going to get dragged down to there. Right? Make sense? Okay. So we know that's the, that's review. We know how to do that stuff. That's no big deal. So let's review real quick. We got these two forms for quadratic functions. We've got standard form. f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. We're using that one a lot now, right, with quadratic formula. We did vertex form, which is a good one for graphing. a times the quantity x minus h squared plus k. And we've actually done another one, even though we haven't talked about it very much. We did some stuff earlier in the year where we did, a, we did some factoring. Where we took a, a, a quadratic function in standard form and we broke it apart into factors. And if we, most of the time when we did that, well, all the time, we were setting those, we were setting the function equal to zero to find the zeros for the function, to find the x-intercepts. But we could have also done this. We could have just left it in that form. What did it look like? Well, we might have had some number out front, some greatest common factor, remember. And then inside, we always had these x's, right? Like it might have been x plus 2 and x minus 3 or something like that, right? We had these x values, and then we set the factors equal to 0 to find the zeros, right? Let's just write it like this, though, where p and q are the numbers that are being subtracted from x. You know, let's think what those are going to mean. Let's take an example. <coughs> so what if we did something like, like this? What if we started off with the example uh, f of x equals 2 times x plus 4 times x minus 2, if that's our function? Okay, if we were trying to set this equal to zero, to find the zeros, what did we do? How, how, did we do, how did we solve this? I mean, if you did the work to get it to that point, what are the solutions? Negative four and positive two, right? Because we're just gonna, we know that the product of these factors can only equal zero, so the y value can only equal zero, the function equals zero when the factors are zero. So one answer was negative four, and the other one was positive two. Right now, let's just look at a graph of this really quick so we can, we can remind ourselves what the relationship is. Okay, so I'm gonna graph the function Okay, so there it is. There's the function y equals, or f of x, let's call it f of x. f of x equals 2 times x plus 4 times x minus 2, right? So there it's graphed. Okay, what do you notice about this function? Where are the x-intercepts? 
on the x-axis at negative 4 and positive 2, right? Doesn't that make sense? Now, this is, this is kind of an important part of math because this is where we take a lot of the stuff that we've talked about in the past and it all kind of comes together, right? The meaning of a zero of a function is where the function equals zero. Well, the function f of x is a fancy name for y. Where on the xy plane, again, does y equal zero always? The x-axis, right? So when we find the zeros of a function, if we get, like we talked about yesterday, if we get real numbers, if the zeros of the function, if we get real solutions, then those end up being x-intercepts, right? Okay? So if that's the case, let's compare this function to our new, our new, uh, factored form, right, where we said f of x equals a times x minus p times x minus q. What's a? 2. a is 2, right? What are p and q? What's p? Okay, p is negative 4, isn't it, right? So P is negative 4, and Q is, okay, the negative 4 and 2 sound familiar. Those ended up being Rx intercepts, right? So when we write a function in factored form like this, A means the same as it did in all the other forms. A is always just A. But this time, instead of H and K, we've got P and Q, and the P and Q correspond to the X intercepts of the function. Sometimes this is called, we, we call it factored form usually, but sometimes it's called in some books intercepts form. How come? Because it gives you the x-intercepts, right? Okay, so if we go back then to, to our factored form or our intercept form, what's the stuff that we know? Well, A is important because that's still our dilation factor. But P and Q are important because they give us x-intercepts. Now, think how easy it's going to be to graph a function if they give us the values of the x-intercepts. It's not a big deal. Let's take this example. What about this one? Everybody agree this is in factored form. Okay. So what are the values if we compare this to A times x minus P times x minus Q? What's the value of A? One half. One half. Honestly, we don't even care. When we're we're going to find out that when we graph a function like this in factored form, we don't really care what A is. We don't even have to bother doing the dilation part. It will take care of itself, and you, you'll see why. What's P? Negative 6. Negative 6, good. What's Q? Negative 2. Negative 2. So where are our intercepts this time? Negative, negative, six six and and negative, two. negative 6 and negative 2. Okay, so there's one point right there, and there's one point right there. Okay, what can you tell me? we got to kind of put on our detective hat for a second here. What can you tell me about this parabola? If it goes through the x-axis at those values, at negative 6 and negative 2, uh, can anybody tell me what the x-coordinate of the vertex is going to be? What's it going to be? It's got to be halfway in between, doesn't it? Because think what parabolas look like. Parabolas always are symmetrical. They always have folding symmetry, right? So I would have had to, like for example, kind of think about this in terms of what if I had only drawn this point right here, like in wet ink, if I fold the parabola over its midline, over the axis of symmetry, shouldn't this point create that one? Right? The imprint of this point would create that point because that's the kind of symmetry that a parabola has, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? So then we know that the midline has to be halfway in between these. And what's the value halfway in between negative 6 and negative 2? Negative, negative 4. Now, how could you find that? That's an easy one to find, right? But how could you find that mathematically if it was a little harder to find? What if it wasn't a nice, cool number like that? How can you always find the middle value of two numbers? Yeah, it's the average, isn't it? Right? That's what the average means, is the middle value. So we add the two up and divide by two, right? So we end up then, if we take negative six plus negative two divided by two, it gives us negative eight 
over 2 is negative 4, right? So that's got to be the x-coordinate of the vertex. Just like any function, if I know the x-coordinate, how do I find the y-coordinate? Any function. Plug it in. Right. Yeah, we plug it in. If I know that x is, that x is negative 4, if that's going to be the x-coordinate of the vertex, then I can just plug negative 4 into my function to find out what the y value is that goes with negative 4. That's going to be the y coordinate of the vertex. So k, in this case, is just going to equal, this is h, right? Equals f of h equals f of negative 4. So we'll just plug that into our function. What's that going to give us? If we plug that into the function, one half times, yeah, what's, what, what's negative 4 plus 6? Yeah, so we're going to get one half times 2, negative 4 plus 2, negative 2. So one half times 2 is 1 times negative 2 is negative 2. Okay, so then we know that the vertex has to be down here at negative 2, right? And so it's going to be the x value is negative 4, the y value is negative 2, and so this is our parabola, right? Does that make sense? Okay, that's how we can easily make a pretty quick sketch of the parabola. Right? If we had to boil that down to kind of a pattern that we're following, when we're in factor form, P and Q are the x-intercepts of the function. How did I find H again? The x-coordinate of the vertex, how is that related to the x-intercepts? I heard it. JJ, what is it? It's the average. <coughs> so it's just going to be P plus Q over 2, and K is just F of H. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Have at it. I want you to work on this stuff a little bit. I got some assignments up. Thank you.